Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is January 28th, year 2024, and it is 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. I hope you are doing well today and tomorrow. As you see, the title of today's talk is Beware. Beware the Seductive Legacy of Maria Orsic. Because as you see on YouTube, the pic, it's probably the only one that we know about that's available. Maybe in the future, another photo or series of portraits will be um, released or discovered. But uh, she's extremely beautiful, highly intelligent, as we'll talk about in a moment. And um, her arguments are very timely for 2024. In amidst this time of so-called disclosure on the part of the government. So all the different elements are lined up to catapult her to the level, to the status of cult hero or a cult heroine, if you will. And I wouldn't be surprised if a movie, a commercial feature film is not in process right now, a pre-production, if not uh, having the finishing touches put on it to release this film. It would be bigger than Oppenheimer, I'm sure. <laughs> if anybody wants to write such a script, contact me or to produce a film, contact me. I'd be glad to um, write you the script and to consult as well. I've got some very good uh, narrative ideas that uh, I think would be very effective uh, today in 2024. First of all, before I start, I want to thank Mr. W Matt Williamson of Pop Goes the 60s. That's the YouTube channel, Pop Goes the 60s. And Matt uh, and I had a really interesting, exciting, lively collaboration on his channel uh, last week. So you might want to check that out. It's uh, about the Beatle skeptics. So just look, look up um, Matt Williamson, Beatle skeptics, and you'll get to that page there. And that uh, particular conversation had, has stimulated a good deal of productive, I think, lively response in the comments section. And I believe that today's talk will also stimulate response. If you, if you don't like what I'm saying about Maria Orsic, please feel free to uh, say so. I, I know I'm going to offend some people because uh, she has become a, a cult uh, item, sort of like the Beatles have in, in their own light. So I'm going to expand on this hypothesis. Uh, we've heard time and time again, well, yeah, the Nazis were in, had access to all this incredible technology, and if the war hadn't, hadn't ended, uh, they might be uh, in control of Western Europe, if not the North, North American and South American continents. Uh, they would have won World War II, right? So that's how it goes. But the, the assumption there is that the technology died with the Third Reich. Now, my hypothesis is that it didn't die with the Third Reich. I'm talking about the technology that was derived from occult sources like Maria Orsic, as you probably have figured out by now. Uh, not only did it not die, but it, but it was... Uh, accelerated, was put into play, not necessarily rolled out for public consumption, but the research and development proceeded apace. Probably as soon as World War II ended, or very soon, as soon as they, the Allies uh, sorted out the useful criminals from the sacrificial criminals, and I say this, I don't mean to sound cynical, but uh, we know that a lot of these criminals came to the United States in the form of Operation Paperclip. And the Soviets themselves had something equivalent and, and brought German scientists over to their part of the so-called Iron Curtain. And um, a lot of them remained in place in the post-war period in Germany. By that time, it had been divided between East and West right, during the immediate Cold War. And then, of course, Germany was uh, unified. When was that? In 89, something like that? I was there shortly after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, 1990. It was quite an exciting time. Uh, of course, I, I, did, I didn't have a clue about Maria Orsic or the occultic underpinnings. I knew a little bit, but not, not as much as 
I do now because the literature has really exploded over the past 20 years. So speaking of literature, this particular talk is going to be, let me see if it's showing up without glare on my monitor here. I'll try to get writing Nazi billionaires. Right, it's by David DeJong. We'll, we'll take a look at him in a moment on a clip I prepared. It's called the the subtitle is "The Dark History of Germany's Wealthiest Dynasties." Okay, this is 2023. So this is a it's not just an update, but it's a more comprehensive survey of at least five, and there's many, many more of the key families because these um. Corporations are are structured very strictly along bloodlines, um, Aryan bloodlines too. <laughs> I told you it didn't end at the end of World War II. Um, I don't know very many Jewish-owned uh, manufacturing or um, uh, other types of distribution concerns that the Germans Aryanized beginning in the run-up to what became World War II. So we'll talk about that. They expropriated. I'm talking about the. Uh, the Third Reich expropriated, I, I can't put a monetary figure. I don't even think the so-called experts know how many hundreds of millions of dollars were expropriated by the regime. And um, not not to mention um, the slave labor that was uh, brought in to man these uh, factories, not just armaments, but also I, I, I found, I've learned a lot from this book here, but also consumer goods, right? We're thinking they were they were defending the country, the, the homeland, by uh, producing ammunition, and they were doing that in tanks and aircraft and supplying the, the war effort. But they are also pr producing consumer goods, and many of these consumer companies, yeah, they took a little dip during uh, the immediate post-war period while the Allies were sorting out who was complicit and who was not complicit. But more case of all, were you a really bad Nazi or were you just an acceptable Nazi? And as I've already stated to in uh, De Jong, the author here makes a good case that most of them were, uh, well, they were rehabilitated. They might have spent some prison time. They might have had a stigma attached to them slightly. But they very rapidly in the post-war period uh, were able to recapture their uh, their enormous wealth again at the expense of um aryanized that was the euphemism that was used i don't know what the german term is i'd have to look it up it's called the aryanization of businesses uh just like businesses in in the united states were not necessarily aryanized but were um closed down during the recent lockdown if you know what i mean by the way i'm going to keep going back compare nazi germany with the United States of uh, 2024, because there's a lot of similarities there. And I'm not just saying that because it's cool, it's chic, it's trendy, it's a cliche to talk about the Fourth Reich. I'm, I'm talking about structural similarities. In fact, this book here was written in part, according to Zhang's uh, in introduction, was written in response to the resurgence of the radical right in German politics. So he's reminding us of this history here. And I'm bringing the United States because I want you to understand. And that's why I say, beware the seductions of Maria Orsic. I bring in the United States because we too were the beneficiaries of this expropriative process, slave labor, and um, of course, creating safe harbor to uh, thousands of war criminals, uh, including uh, Dr. Wendel von Braun, who we've all heard by now. It's almost a cliche and a joke, right? But uh, it's very real to um, even um, people who are still alive, who are maybe in their 90s or, you know, maybe early 100-year-old. Amazing they could survive such hardship over that that span of time. Incredible point in human civilization that we call the, the, uh, the 20th century. Wow, the 20th century. Um, the second book, in addition to Nazi billionaires that I'll be looking at, is this one here. Uh, I can't see. There's a glare. Can't see it exactly. But it's by um, Maximilien de Lafayette, 
I think that's a pen name. Uh, it's you know, it's pretty unlikely. There's a, maybe maybe I'm wrong. If I'm Mr. Lafayette, Monsieur Lafayette, if I'm incorrect, I don't mean to insult you. Please comment below that that is indeed your name, uh, not a nom de plume. Uh, and please leave your um, contact information because I'd like to invite you on as a guest here for the, the, the body of work that you have produced. Without me uh, opining or judging you or the movement that you represented or are writing about in research. And I will say, and don't blame me, this because I'm not a Nazi, okay? And I don't, I'm not a believer in the a thousand year Reich or any other duration of Reich. Um, I, I'm, in fact, I'm very cautious, as, as you can tell by the title, of in any way endorsing the ideas, the beliefs, the behavior of Mia, uh, Maria Orsic, even though she presents herself as a dispatch, dispassionate scientist, a woman of science, and a, a highly refined and sophisticated occultist, right? We can grant her all that, but that does not necessarily... And she was also... Um, she was not a member of the Nazi party. That's important to note. And Lafayette uh, makes that clear. She was never a Nazi. In fact, she despised certain figures within the... Uh, National Socialist uh, movement, and uh, they returned the favor a lot like Himmler. Didn't trust uh, Maria Orsic, and they, she might have been killed had she not fled. Uh, I think she was in Berlin at the time. If she had not fled Germany prior to the fall of, uh, of Berlin and the, uh, the deaths of some key figures within the Nazi, re Nazi regime, including reportedly, don't get mad at me if you don't believe it, but um, uh, because I have my suspicions as well, including people like uh, the Reichsfuhrer Adolf Hitler and his wife. He married her late, uh, so she was no longer a mistress. Eva Braun and um, let's see, uh, Josef Goebbels was also uh, the he and his, I think it was a murder-suicide, him and his wife, Magda, who I'll talk about in a moment, just briefly. And uh, they, uh, the Goebbels couple um, had their um, six daughters, six, they were, I think they were all under the teenage years, had them poisoned to death in a suicide uh, as uh, Berlin was falling to the Allies. Now, one of them, or I think two of the sons, they had a large family. The uh, the Goebbels, and uh, two I think it's two of them. At least one uh, escaped suicide or being suicided, and he went on to resurrect the Bayerisch Motorenwerke, otherwise known as BMW, headquartered in München or uh, Munich, right? And um, you you all know the the badge on the automobile BMW that signifies quality, top notch engineering. Is it alien engineering? I don't know. Maybe we can talk about that in a moment. Um, luxury, it's synonymous with luxury cars, along with uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz that was an outgrowth of Daimler-Benz and um, Porsche. And uh, Ferdinand Porsche himself uh, was very much connected with uh, Daimler-Benz. And uh, I don't know if he had connections. With, they all knew each other. They, they all socialized together. They were all on board, all the captains of industry, every single one of them. I mean, I'm talking about the, the large businesses, right? The industrialists, let's call them, the Nazi billionaires. Every single one of them were, um, if not allied with the Nazis, they were they were members of the apartheid itself, all right? And um, I've already mentioned BMW. You know, that's one of the top automobile manufacturers around the world, Uh uh, to this to this very day, and um, full disclosure, I have in the past owned not one but two BMWs. Now, <laughs> in my defense, they were both used, very well used. Um, I, you know, and you can repair them, and then they can run forever, like a Mercedes. Um, at least with the old mechanical uh, system, the new ones today, I, I don't know. They're probably disposed. I haven't had a Mercedes. Uh, a BMW since I've never owned a Mercedes. Uh, I have owned in my lifetime of car ownership, owned two 
Volkswagens, right? We all know the story of Volkswagens, right? The, the first, first one that rolled off the line, courtesy of Ferdinand Porsche. Yes, the guy who went on to notoriety with the Porsche automobile. He, he was already well known as an automobile uh, authority all over the world, but on a consumer level, the Porsche name is synonymous again with German technology. And the question is, gosh, where do all these principles come from? These engineering principles come from? Did were they that brilliant of a people? Was the engineering so sophisticated, or was there an alien connection? There was there alien contact that uh, the Germans during the Reich and, and after the war were able to exploit to rebuild Nazi, uh, rebuild post-war Germany and its allies, which would be the U.S. Not necessarily political allies or, but um, uh, the vanquished uh, leader of the free world now, the United States, um, versus that of the Soviet Union. Because remember, Germany was divided into two after World War II. And that's one of the reasons why, the, by the way, that these uh, German industrialists were brought back into the fold of the so-called free world is because they didn't want them to go into the communist camp, right? And everybody was going to make out from it, including uh, the um, the Volkswagen company, right? I'm you know I'm old enough to remember when they start first started coming into America because prior to that. You know, my parents and my friends, they only drove Fords and Chevrolets and some of the richer ones had a Chrysler or a Dodge. You know, I can't remember. The, most of the brands are gone now, right? And the Japanese automobiles came in as well soon after that. My father was also um, the one of the first owners in, in the American market of the Toyota. It was the Toyota Corona, right? The reason I mention this is because... All of us, everybody who's watching here, if you live and breathe, you have consumed German. We're talking about Germany now. We can talk about Japan, post-war Japan at another time. But you've consumed and continue to consume German products that are the result of this uh, post-Nazi regime to this very day. Uh, let me see. Okay, before I get into providing you details... I'll give you one tidbit so you'll hang in there, right? This, there's so much material here. One tidbit, and this just fascinated me, you know, because I thought Pete's coffee, P-E-E-T apostrophe, Pete's, if you're out of the West or the California, is a chain of high-end cafes, coffee shops. The coffee's pretty good and the mixed stuff. Um, come, You know, from a mix, I think, the chai and some... You know, it's not that great, but it's upper end. It's slightly better than Starbucks. But that's Pete's. I thought it was independently owned. It started in Berkeley, California, by the way. And they had a roaster, and it really kind of, Pete's helped to kick off the the coffee craze in America. America was way behind Europe, especially Western Europe that, that I know of. Um, so far as coffee culture is concerned, cafe culture, we used to have the really lousy, watery coffee Maxwell House or Folgers or whatever it is. And then beginning in the, I think in the, as early as the late 60s, definitely the 70s and 80s, Americans started traveling the world a little bit more and became more sophisticated and found out that, hey, coffee can be a really nice uh, treat for us at fairly inexpensive levels. So pizza is now owned by one of these companies, right? It's called a job, J-A-B. I don't know what the initials stand for. It's a consumer goods uh, corporation. And I found out that they um, also own Noah's Bagels, right? which surprised the you know, heck out of me. In fact, where I live, there's a Pete's here and right separating, there's a grating or a, a, a little fence that separates Pete's from Noah's. Right, they're right next to each other, and I also thought it was a curious arrangement. It's because they're owned by the same German multinational, and on and on they own cosmetics, the Coty brands. These are all American companies, by the way. Since 2000, fairly recently, 2015, 16, something like that, this particular company has invested 50 uh, million dollars acquiring, uh, acquiring all these different American companies. So we are being bought out, and it's not the chat camps. 
that are doing it, but it's the friendly Germans who are doing it. By the way, they also bought in Germany, they bought a lot of Jewish, previously Jewish owned uh, business, large businesses, uh, unbeknownst to the family owners of it, who are horrified that uh, that their family holdings uh, wound back up in uh, Aryan hands. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit more about the Orsich book. I would, even though I caution against accepting her as a cult heroine, I do believe this book is very important. Um, Lafayette has written several volumes on the UFOs, Maria uh, Orsich, the her Ville uh, Gesellschaft or Real Society, and the various occult secret societies, organizations that undergird the German economic miracle, right? That's the second time I've said that. I'm going to underscore it again. The German post-war economic miracle would not be possible had it not been for these occult foundations. Now, did Maria Orsich work for BMW or was she supportive of these these large uh, family-run conglomerates? I don't know. Probably not. Uh, she had um, supposedly, according to Lafayette, uh, altruistic humanitarian, even though she believed in ETs, but she had altruistic, let's say, motives for the type of technology that she brought to the fore. And of course, they were expropriated or adopted by the, the, the Nazi war machine and the U.S. war machine by extension, which I'll get to in a moment. So and the point I'm making is I have kind of a mixed feelings about the Lafayette book. I don't want to fuel the excitement over Maria Orsich with her long blonde hair and all her friends who were, they were all celibate supposedly, and they were the epitome of, uh, of Teutonic womanhood who were brilliant as, as engineers, as pilots, uh, as ideologues um, as well. I don't want to incur encourage that. And plus, in reading the, the literature, you find out very quickly, if you if you know what you're reading, is that um, she was a Luciferian. She doesn't talk about that in those terms, but she's a Gnostic. She doesn't believe in God. She thinks the, the Bible, she doesn't put it in disparaging terms, but it's clear that she does not believe Scripture, the divinity of Jesus Christ, any of the saints, none of it. But she does believe in the Aldebarans. Al is in Arabic language, Aldebaran, right? These are the people in uh, Alpha Centauri, I can't remember the solar system, who come from, you know, the so-called space brothers that come from off planet, planet Earth and have come here to share their secrets with us for benevolent purposes. Ha ha. So, you know, uh, I'm skeptical about that. And I'm I'm skeptical that they're here for friendly purposes. Uh, who knows? They may be trying to, they're going to use us as a slave. They, they did come to, um, or their ancestors, the Nephilim, did come to earth and meet with beautiful women, right? Human women, according to the Bible. Um, so she is, a, I would place her as a Gnostic. I think people who are her fans would deny it. And her uh, fanboys would probably <clears throat> get very upset if I, uh, you know, am overly critical of their, their, uh, their Germanic, uh, even though she's Croatian, their love goddess, right? Just like the, you know, when you get into the Beatles talk, uh, well, how can you say that about uh, Georgie Porgy Harrison, you know, even though he was a Hindu love god who'd like to sleep with any woman he met, he could get away with it too, because man, he was he was a Beatle, right? That's one insight, by the way, that I'm bringing to Be Beatles historiography. Explore the life of George Harrison as a Hindu, a tantric love god. He wanted a cult around him to, so he could have freedom to sleep with all the women he want as, as a means of, of reaching a higher level of consciousness and awareness and transcendence. And I'm bringing that in there because uh, a, a lot of these figures do have a, a sexual power uh, undertone to them in, in Marie Orsich, she's much, in her circle of real society versions or celibates. She's uh, made even more attractive by the fact that she's unattainable, right? She's in possession of that incredible human constructed 
material called unobtainium. <laughs> you, if you can't get it, you want it. Just like diamonds and the lust for gold and silver, you cannot have Maria Orsich, her mojo. And finally, I don't know how far I'm going to get into this because my introduction has already run far too long. Finally, is a, a, another book that I've been reading lately. And these kind of all meld or mesh well together, even though authors probably didn't intend it, is a book by D.W. Pasulka, and it's titled Encounters, also published in 2020. This is a 2013, but this is also came out last year. It's new. And the subtitle is Experiences with Non-Human Intelligences, Explorations with UFOs, Dreams, Angels, AI, and Other Dimensions. All right. And uh, what's interesting about her, amongst many other biographical parts, is that she has a legitimate uh, academic position. I, I hope, I think she's tenured in, because um, she's, she's written a couple of other books, too. I don't know. They're probably more academic in nature. They're monographs. This is for a, a, uh, the general educated public, the literate public. It's not an academic study. That's not a knock on her. I'm just saying that's not the market. It's a tra that's called trade publishing, and this is St. Martin's. And um, if you can do this on your own, I'll I'll maybe if I have time, show her a little bit of a clip from her from the Joe Rogan um, show, right? The Joe Rogan Experience. If you can hit Joe Rogan, you're going to sell some copies. You can sell some books. And if you get on Joe Rogan, man. You're gonna. You're on your way to a, a really nice uh, fanboy universe there. That's gonna gonna make you super popular. So uh, I'm sure that's gonna make your colleagues over at the University of Carolina, uh, North Carolina, University of North Carolina, Wilmington is where she teaches. Chapel Hill is the UNC um, flagship school, but she's in Wilmington. I'm sure they're gonna be very jealous of uh, Professor Pazulka. For all her, all the notoriety she's getting, I mean, man, how many of her colleagues get on uh, the Joe Rogan show? Probably zero of them, because they're teaching critical race theory and GLBTQ and how to be a transsexual and tranny and whatever else that they have on the uh, the foundations, uh, the the corporate foundation programs. By the way, I'm mentioning this not gratuitously and not just to throw you red meat, but uh, it's clear to me by now that that uh, GLBTQ and all the other letters that go with it, and a BLT, Black Lives Matter, or BLM, I'm sorry, and uh, even earlier than that, La Raza, or all the ethnic-specific, ethno-fascist groups that are out there amongst whatever group, even Asians have them, right? Um, and that, you know, whatever group we're talking about and that are that they're exploiting or using or promoting at the university. Those were are funded by corporations. You got it? a lot of them from these German billionaire foundations or American billionaire or, or British. The nationality varies, but the agenda is a globalist one. And you know what's behind that, right? The United Nations uh, population reduction, right? But point I'm making here is that it's also thrown out there as a smokescreen so that the globalist corporatization, corporatist takeover of the world economy goes unnoticed while we're saying, hey, let's get rid of uh, uh, drag in, in the libraries. I mean, I don't want to see it there either, but how long are you going to be uh, crying and moaning about that? And uh, they put all these, those, the other side, they put all these provocations out there uh, purposely so that we don't look at what's of history as it's been put history being made behind our backs because it's silent it's quiet it's surreptitious so so much easier to fund some gay organization or some lesbian or or some obnoxious characters and let them take the heat while these people here are making history right so um Whenever this comes out on the, the different pop-up pundit channels, just turn it, start start researching um, and looking at at um, less um, popular types of um, wolf, uh, dog whistle type material, right? 
Um, that's taking us in, like like I said, this is taking on, uh, us down the wrong road. Uh, when I say us, it means supposedly these people are on our side, but not really, you know, not really because they're distracting. Will, will Tucker Carlson um, keep feeding what we want to hear about all these characters, crazy as they are? Or he's going to actually get into the structure of um, NPR, National Public Radio, or National Petroleum Radio, whatever it might be. Is he really going to dig in that? No, he won't. He can't. Because he's part, he comes out right out of that system, right? So this is why we have to dig a little bit further, and this is why we cannot accept this notion that, hey, I understand it, I get it, you know? Maria Orsic is a great genius, an unheralded uh, innovator in, in anti-gravity technology, and we should worship her. And you can take any of these characters that are being promoted by so-called alternative media, not to discount their... I'm talking about the characters that are promoting, not to discount their contributions. Uh, people like Nikola Tesla, right? It's like, oh, yes, he's our hero. He's our... You know what? His technology has not been used for good, right? He might have thought it was going to be used for good, but he got in bed with uh, Thomas Edison and the Warburgs. You know, the whole story. At least Maria Orsic did not get in bed with anybody. I told you she was celibate. But politically, she didn't either. She fled. No no one knows where she wound up. Uh, that'll be interesting to find out. And, but there, it does seem to be true that there was someone called Maria Orsic. Uh, no one's seen her birth certificate. This is what Lafayette says. No one sees any official documentation of her being... Uh, here, there, or everywhere, but there are a lot of letters, first person knowledge that's been written about of her. So she is a real person. And the reasons for her van vanishing from the page of history uh, are yet to be known. So this is an exciting time for all of us. I forgot to welcome everybody here and Nuclear Agenda 21. I don't worship anyone. You could admire them, good. I would agree. National Propaganda Radio. Okay. Yeah. Right. The, the canonization, right? The canonization process. Uh, be, be careful of that. All right. Let me just show you a very brief, because most of you know this. You've read about IG Farben, uh, but you didn't know the extent to which the Nazi billionaires continued into the post-war period up into the present day. Here's just a very brief clip that kind of describes that process. Okay, I removed that from the studio because I think I'm having uh, memory problems on the uh, hard drive here, I'm running out of space. But anyway, that clip goes through and introduces the work of David DeJong. He goes through and talks about five families, but this particular documentary, the intro to it, talks about only three of them. Um, oh, this book, by the way, is lavishly illustrated. It's got um, a photo. It doesn't look faked, by the way. It's a photo of uh, Josef Goebbels with Magda Goebbels. That was her second husband, by the way. She was divorced. She married a German industrialist who was also close to the uh, Reich, uh, Third Reich upper-level political establishment. And then accompanying them is, their, um, is Goebbels' steps. And you can't really see it here, but, uh, so you have to buy the book or go to the library. Uh, he's the guy that took over BMW yeah, during the post-war period. Um, uh, the name, family name is Quant, Q-U-A-N-D-T. That's a name that I was not aware of. Uh, and uh, some of these other ones I'm not, I was not uh, aware of either. And I hope this opens up more research and, and of course, the spread of uh, information about these companies who we think are American, but they're actually 
post-war German Nazi billionaire companies, right? I'll give an example. This is on page 270. It says, um, yeah, since 2012, this company job, JAB, has spent 50, oh, not, not 50 million, that's way too small, so $50 billion to acquire all American food and beverage, beverage brands, including Snapple, Dr. Pepper, <laughs> Krispy Kreme Donuts is a German guy. I didn't know that. Pete's Coffee, I already mentioned that. Einstein Brothers, that's a bagel company. Uh, Strumptown Coffee Roasters, that must be a regional coffee chain or something. Chloe Rig, Green Mountain, they make these machines and and they sell the, the coffee there. Panera Bread, they have those chains pretty much all everywhere in these new mini malls or shopping mall, outdoor malls because the indoor malls are dead. And uh, they own Coty, which used to be an American company, C-O-T-Y. And uh, they own Bali. I think that was originally Swiss. That's not too big of a stretch for a German company to buy a Swiss company. And they once owned Jimmy Choo, right? C-H-O-O, -O, right? Made famous by, uh, uh, what's the show? Sex in the City. Jimmy Choo's Choo's. Anyway, it goes on there, and there's different families that are involved, not just in high technology, but in consumer, the consumer economy as well. All right, let me move on to the next one here. Uh, let's look at uh, Maria Orsic, her fateful meeting at uh, the, was it Schopenhauer Cafe? With other occultists, as, as I stated at the outset of this talk, they gather together to exchange information about uh, occult scholarship and wisdom drawn from various traditions, primarily Teutonic, as they call it, or Nordic, but also from other parts of the world, including, as most of you know, Tibet. Tibet was was a very very much of interest to uh, Heinrich Himmler, and he funded expeditions to go there to. Uh, extract their their secrets and apparently and this is something that i learned from de jong is that there's even a small tibetan community uh in germany i don't know where it is uh, tibetan buddhists not tibetans just as such so let me see if i can get this one started up here for you that's a very short one so pay attention in 1917 Four men and a woman met here in the Viennese Café Schopenhauer. The young Maria Ortisch, a spiritualistic medium from Zagreb. The student and fighter pilot Lothar Weitz. The occultist, orientalist and officer Karl Haushofer. Rudolf von Sebottendorf, an occultist who had recently returned from the Orient. As well as Prelate Gernot from the Order of Knights Templar. Their subject was the coming of the new age. They spoke of secret revelations, the spear of destiny, the magical violet black stone. They discussed the possibility of making transmedial contact with the ancient Germanic and Babylonian deities, Ishtar Ostara and Isais. Quite likely that this coffee house meeting witnessed the birth of the secret Tula society, which in turn later spawned the German National Socialist Party, the SS, Black Sun, and the Friel Society, which in its turn gave a foundation to the occult activities of the Third Reich and the new comprehensive technology. And the beginning of German UFOs. What was the secret behind it all? The invincible source of power for them was the Black Sun, an infinite beam of light which, although invisible to the human eye, was nevertheless there and very real. Just as the bright daylight sun can illuminate the exterior, so the dark sun can light up the soul of man. Yes, light up the dark soul of man, the Black Sun Society. There's tons of literature on this. Uh, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, of course, most of you know the work of 
um, Pharrell, right? And um, uh, Lavenda, people like that. But there's some people who are uh, have been doing scholarship in this area for, for quite a long time. And it's now beginning to filter in down into the larger edu educated population, uh, as we're seeing with uh, the David de Jong book. And finally, it'll probably have to, at some point, even pr trickle down to the academic community. They're always the last ones to catch on. I think uh, Pasulka is one of the early uh, people to to bring in these uh, the study of anomalous experiences. I mean, she there, she has predecessors, John, Doctor John Mack at uh, Yale, um, a couple of other people. Uh, what's his name? David. Um, can't remember. He was at the University of. Uh, Arizona State, and I can't remember his name. Most of these books I've read, okay, so uh, Jacques Vallée, who I don't think he's ever had an academic appointment, but um, he has a pretty good um, resume so far as um, academics are concerned. So we're seeing here that the occult, and again, this is the fourth time I'm saying this, the occult sciences are instrumental to the technology of the present, right? And going back to the earlier discussions, I've had two of them so far with Matt Williamson on the Beatles, is that the UK and the United States were very much um, influenced by the, the Anglo-American occult revival. This is uh, in Britain, it started a little bit earlier, but and certainly in the U.S. by the early 20th century, uh, there was a, a, a huge interest uh, in the occult sciences or the occult arts, if you will. And I mentioned in previous talks, one on Stanford University, Jane Stanford, the co-founder with her husband, Leland Stanford, and uh, also the woman, um, Phoebe Hurst, who founded, or not founded, but was one of the instrumental figures in the development of the University of California, they were both occultists of their time. They were products of this occult revival in the United States. And that was also going on in Britain. That's why I call it Anglo-American. And the Beatles, as we know uh, by now, that if you look on the cover of Sgt. Pepper, you will see people like Madame Blavatsky, Aleister Crowley. There's some other people in there that uh, escape my... Uh, memory at this point, who are um, a nod to the great larger occult revival, right? So this is much more, what we're talking about today is much more, and has been much more mainstream that we are willing to admit. Uh, we are assuming that they're, they're just one-offs or they're aberrant, all right? I'm taking the position that they're not one-offs and they're not aberrant. They're consistent with a larger underlying substrate, a lot underlying foundation that is common with, with late capitalism, whether it's the United States, Britain, Germany, all the ma major, uh, or Japan, uh, all the major industrial capitalists or post-industrial capitalist societies have a very strong uh, tradition of the occult sciences uh, in Japan, which I'm not going to talk about too much today. Um, and, but I have given talks on this. In Japan, there's a very strong Freemasonic uh, component that started to um, creep in around the mid part of 19th century Japan. It, it's what, what helped uh, to overturn the medieval system into the current Rothschild run Central Bank of Japan system. Uh, in addition to that, they had their own indigenous uh, occult traditions that are coded uh, in the popular culture. Uh, as martial arts, right? There's a, that whole genre of films that have been popularized by the fanboy, um, uh, like Quentin Tarantino and these other ripoff artists, you know, and all the people who grew up learning history at a VHS uh, tape store. <laughs> you know, they've never read anything, but they've seen every movie that's been made, uh, no matter how awful it is. Uh, Richard Rodriguez is another one sort of fanboy cinema that just kind of um, eats itself, right? Um, but but all those traditions, and they've been trivialized. And by the way, the people who who practice these dark arts in places like Japan or Germany, they, they don't care if you um, 
expropriate their their contributions and make it into a pop film because that gives them cover, right? You just say, well, it's just um, it's just uh, you know entertainment. It's not really serious, but it's as serious as a heart attack, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Japanese fascism was implemented a large to a large degree through dojo. You know, they're called dojo is a hall of enlightenment for martial, and it's still practiced heavily uh, in uh, throughout. Uh, the Japanese archipelago. Uh, and I'm not talking about the uh, karate or mixed martial arts little franchise at your local mini mall or, you know, uh, you know the local. I'm not saying that's, you know, that um, they're subpar, but um, I'm, that's not what I'm talking about here. And the same goes for Germany as we're talking about. All right. Do you understand? This is continuous and integral to Contemporary corporate capitalism, corporatist capitalism, where the military, the corporation, and the political system fuse together. That's also the definition of fascism, but we can call it corporatism because uh, Americans don't like to view their political system as fascist. But um, but if we call it corporatist, maybe we'll get people to understand that these are an anti-democratic institutions, right? whether it's in Germany, Japan, or the United States. So um, what we have then here is uh, this myth of the rehabilitated Germany, first West Germany, then it was reunified in uh, 89, was it? Yeah, uh, right. East and West no longer existed as separate entities politically, and they fused. The rehabilitation of uh, Germany is a, is, a, is a myth. And why is that important to us today? Well, if you've been reading the news, the war drums are being beaten by the German political establishment saying that, oh, get ready for war against Russia, right? So these, um, these currents of conflict, of tensions, uh, have never fully gone away, and they can re be remobilized very quickly, right? We saw, at least I did when I was in the a child of the Cold War saw the uh, Soviets as being really evil, right? Evil empire, is, as uh, Reagan later called it. And then there was um, uh, Gorbachev, and there was a rapprochement between the Soviet and the Soviet Union dissolved in different different republics. And then the Russians were okay, and uh, now we're back to hating uh, Russia, right? Russia phobia, right? So they can. These, these currents are always there, and they can be mobilized by these demagogues in a population that has zero historical memory, right? And in addition to putting out these astroturf or inorganic fake progressive movements like Antifa and La Raza and um, Asian American studies or w whatever it is, you know, that ethnic studies, um, Black Lives Matter, in order to provide the smokescreen for this uh, corporate corporate globalist uh, takeover, uh, as we've seen. It's been a myth. I also thought it's kind of interesting, if I can digress for a moment, that the Beatles, um, they really refined their craft up in Germany. They were in Hamburg, which happened to be, I don't think it was accidental, was also the American zone. I think it was uh, the British and the Americans, but primarily Americans, ran that part of uh, West Germany. And uh, that's where they, you know, performed uh, the equivalent of three hours a day for a solid year. That That's what 1,100 hours will do for you before they came back to Britain and became big time. So they played, you know, they played for that audience. And the reason I mention this is because it's also, uh, I think, a seminal moment where the post-war youth came together, which uh, was viewed uh, by the Allies as being positive in one way, but also dangerous in the sense that uh, when, when the young people started gathering together with their own uh, political ideas and cultural forms, that they would pose a, a threat to the establishment. And that's one of the reasons, I think, in a larger sense, why uh, John Lennon was assassinated, and later uh, George Harrison was also killed, right? So when we're talking about these countries here, they kind of all blend together. Um, 
All right. Let me talk a little bit more about the uh, the quant family, Q U A N T. Uh, just to give you some of the low lights of the low life people of the quant dynasty, the Nazi billionaires. Uh, he Aryanized any number of Jewish owned businesses. That was the euphemism, Aryanization. And uh, he had six, about 60,000 slave laborers, and they weren't all Jews. They were Slavs. There were a lot of anti Slavic or Slav. Um, sentiment, not just anti-Semitism. Some were POWs. Um, the job company, as I mentioned, uh, uh, had about, I don't know, a couple of hundred French nationals who were, were used as uh, POWs. So they were pretty, you know, equal opportunity employers so far as slave labor is concerned. Whoever they can... Um, capture and go to work in the families there. Anyway, as I mentioned before, Magda Quant married uh, Josef Goebbels in 1931. And I forgot to mention that Hitler, Adolf Hitler, was the best man of Josef Goebbels. And um, yeah, I already told you what happened to the family. They, they, they killed themselves, right? All right. Let me, I guess I won't be able to, um, well, maybe I will, but I think this book here by Rosoko deserves a talk into an entire show unto itself, but I, I just see the continuities between the three. So maybe I can get her to come on the show at some point and, and deal with it, uh, her book and her research. Let's take a look at her encounter with the one and only Joe Rogan to release and not able to release and right. that, that i was like okay yeah really? so i mean i've not seen any any bodies nor have i seen intact craft but i also have had now remember i don't have a clearance like he has so i can actually talk about what people have told me i have had people tell me that yes diana there are intact craft i don't know i mean maybe uh so I don't know, Joe. Have you um, studied Bob Lazar? Okay, yes. I am always asked about Bob Lazar. Yeah. And I don't know, but I can tell you that people that I've met who are associated with the programs tell me that he's, he's, he's right. Now, I know his background, and I know, you know, all the things. I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion one way or the other. But I can also say that a lot of times people with – very disturbing backgrounds, you know, who could be easily discredited are given information and shown things and told things. Well, I would think that that's sort of like a little escape clause. Yeah, I think so. I think it is. I mean, the guy's obviously a genius and was obviously a propulsion expert and put a fucking jet engine on a Honda <laughs> in like the 1980s. He's a, a fast, no, I know. fascinating yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, he claims that there's some element some element that exists other in other places in the universe, which leads me to believe, uh, well, well, not even to believe, but like, so here's the question. Are some of these things from other planets? Is that also in the equation? I mean, just because something is traveling interdimensionally, we do know that there are an infinite number of planets yeah. in the universe. I mean, we have no idea how many of them are capable of supporting human-like life or some other kind of life or uh, an infinite number of varieties of life. And if that life can do what we've done and get to some part of its progression where it's capable of creating what we're calling artificial intelligence or super advanced technology, why wouldn't it come here? Yes. I have, I'm not dis. I'm not discounting it, E.T. So that could be there, too. I think so, especially because of the ways in which the materials are being manufactured off planet, like the ones that we just saw. Mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, the, And that was in formation when I met Tyler 2014, and now it's a full-on thing that's happening, right? So it's, it's a supercharged program of creating things that will help us off planet. I mean, certainly then 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, but I don't know. Right. So I have to just be honest. So it might be a bunch of different things happening all at the same time, interdimensionally, extraterrestrially, something from a distant galaxy that's figured out some new method of propulsion that's beyond our imagination that can visit, and then also things that are coming here from other dimensions. Yes. And even recently, somebody had, you know, yeah, well, I can't say anything. I, I can't say I'm sorry. <laughs> I no. don't want to be that person that okay. goes on your show and no, says, oh, okay. I can't I can't say that. I but I probably the, most likely there are um, cra if there's crash retrieval part, you know, crash retrievals. OK, that is Professor Pasilka. So you can she's got tons of material and there's some frankly, there's some bitter uh, interviews out there with with other people. Rogan's not bad. I know there's a uh, someone in the chat room that doesn't care for him. I, I have mixed feelings about him, um, but he he does ask, he does um, ask the type of questions that will uh, force her to engage the audience in a uh, in a more direct way. But but it's kind of disappointing. Even in this book here, is that um, there's a lot of waffling going on, right? I don't really see anything definitive going on and that that's okay i'm just saying that um in as in the case of maria Orsich, i think there's some even though she claims to be a practicing catholic uh uh there seems to be some uh gnostic influences in her work right about uh, regarding the space brotherhood so i don't know if i'm uh, going to be on board with a lot of the uh, people who are Orsich uh fans and pasilka fans right now who seem to be growing in number now, here's one character who she talks about, and I didn't realize this about him, uh, Jacques Vallée, who she's known for over a decade. And most of you who are in the chat room have at least heard of his name. So, so far as uf ufology is concerned, most of his books, by the way, from, from the 60s are back in print. And he also has a multi-volume series of journals of his and um, I've been reading them uh, over the, over the years and trying to assess the uh, figure, uh, Jacques Vallée. He has a PhD in, I think, computer science, University of Indiana, I think it is. I can't remember. But he's mostly a uh, venture capitalist and uh, uh, one of the most prominent names in ufology and a friend and a colleague of uh, Professor uh, Pazulka. Um, but I did learn through Professor Pazulka from one of her interviews that he is a Rosicrucian, right? So I want to talk about Gnosticism. It's I think a lot of Gnostic elements are being snuck in, which are Luciferian, I will say, uh, are being snuck in through the back door here um, under the guise of uh, ecumenism or even Christianity. So I, I want you to be alert to that. And if it hurts your feelings uh, that I'm saying this, well, you know, too bad. Uh, just join the uh, Paul is Dead crew or whoever else, you know, the other people who have seem to have a certain psychology. It's sort of a dementia. I don't know what it's called. But let's take a, uh, a look at Jacques Vallée before we end here. I have a couple minutes left. Jacques Vallée and what he is to this resurgence that we're going through right now in quote unquote disclosure. By whom and for whom is this disclosure supposed to be taking place? It's not going to help our economy any that I can tell. It's not going to stop the censorship, but it's a pretty good distraction from uh, all these. Other, it's not going to help with the inflation problem, but uh, it's highly entertaining, right? Maybe that's what Joe Rogan's function is. It makes all these issues entertaining for the, for the audience. There is probably no more influential thinker in the study of UFOs than the French astronomer and computer scientist Jacques Vallée. Beginning in the late 1960s, Vallée drew ufologists' attention to the symbolic or metallurgical qualities of UFO reports, and argued that there was a continuity of experience from anomalous sightings and entity encounters in historical folklore and mythology. For pioneering the first alternatives to the extraterrestrial explanation for UFOs, Vallée has earned a reputation as the grandfather of the new ufology, and he's forced ufologists and anomalists of all persuasions to revisit old assumptions about UFOs 
and what it is they're doing here. Dalé had an early exposure to the UFO phenomenon. In 1955, during a wave of sightings in France that started the previous year, a 16-year-old valet and his mother saw a disc with a half dome on top, hovering half a kilometer away from his home in Pontoise. Valet's mother said that the UFO eventually just flew away, leaving a few puffs of white substance behind, but Valet had no memory of seeing it leave. A few years later in 1958, while doing his undergraduate in mathematics, Valet sent a letter to the prominent French ufologist, Aimé Michel, beginning a lifelong correspondence and partnership. Valet then completed the equivalent of a Master of Science in Astrophysics in 1961. While working on staff at the Artificial Satellite Service of the Paris Observatory later that year, Valet learned that his team had tracked the movement of a bright, unknown object orbiting the Earth in retrograde. However, when the team's superior came in to see the evidence, he immediately had the telex tape destroyed. Naturally, this experience convinced Valet that astronomers and other scientists were not always so honest about the data they collected on UFOs. Soon after, in 1962, Valet moved to Evanston, Illinois to begin a PhD in computer science at Northwestern University. There he met Dr. Joseph Allen Hynek, scientific consultant to Project Blue Book, the UFO investigation group of the U.S. Air Force. Together with an informal network of scientists and social scientists, Hynek and Valet shared their UFO research and discussed possible explanations for the data. This group, which included American hypnotherapist Leo Sprinkle and French astrophysicist Claude Poer, called themselves the Invisible College after a network of natural philosophers in the 17th century. Valet published two books on UFOs in this period, Anatomy of a Phenomenon in 1965 and A Challenge to Science in 1966, both of which advocated the popular extraterrestrial hypothesis for UFOs, or the ETH. These books brought a level of scientific rigor to ufology at a time when it was dominated by the sensationalized pulp style of Donald Kehoe and Frank Edwards, and they earned the still young Valet a reputation as a leading authority on the UFO phenomenon. In the fall of 1966, both Valet and Hynek were invited to consult on the recently established scientific study of unidentified flying objects at the University of Colorado Boulder. Both had wanted to join the study's team, but were barred for their public advocacy of UFO research. They were thus powerless to stop project leaders Edward Condon and Robert Lowe from narrowing the study in such a way as to completely disregard the bulk of Blue Book's cases. The final report, commonly referred to as the Condon Report, was published in 1968 and discouraged further research into UFOs concluding that such research would be of no benefit to science or national defense. After the report met with near-unanimous praise from leading scientists and media figures, Valet returned to France in disgust and temporarily retreated from the scientific community. Yes, indeed. By, in 1968, when the Condon Report came out, that was the party line. The official line is that no, no UFOs. We're not going to talk about it. And a number of decades have elapsed. And now we see a resurgence of it over the past couple of years. Government disclosure uh, supposedly is on its way. And I think W uh, D.W. Pasola is one of the, the uh, younger figures who were uh, leading the revival. Something that I encourage, but I also, as, as, I'll, as I leave with you, leave you today, um, I always uh, warn you that um, we could be be uh, led down the slippery slope here of, um, of a, a new form of cultism, right? Or occultism, whether it's uh, Pazulka or Valet, just be careful about that. Or the beautiful Maria Orsic. Otherwise, you'll wind up like these two fanboys right here. Right. This gave me an idea how how deep this is going. I've also seen some poetry and music on online on, on TubeView that are, are dedicated to the cult of Maria Orsic. But here's a couple of grown men who are in tears over her revelations.
So the target was Maria Orsic. She was uh, channeling information for Germany. She has luxurious hair, and I go, I'm not a good enough artist to capture her beauty. She has captivating eyes. And at this point, I started crying. I thought, is this Hitomi? Is this Lon Vo? Because this woman, whoever this is, she can. she's like the power of Hitomi and Lon Vo. And then the term Mother Mary came to me, and I, I started sobbing. And I go, man, she has the gift of psi ability. It wasn't called remote viewing when she did it, but she can do it, and she does readings. Someone who shows up arrives and gives meaning. Oh, that was interesting. Well, what does that mean, I wonder? And they're like a teacher. And there they are, and these people are going to come, and she's going to you know, tell them the meaning of things. The sense is that uh, this one has knowledge and takes time to share it with others. Maybe or has been an actual quote unquote teacher. Saw a person standing there, but the thing that jumped uh, jumped off of the blackboard for me was the fact that I saw literal x-ray visual of the person's brain lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, and it was a female. So I see her brain lit up like a Christmas tree, neurons firing. She's extremely smart. So it felt like a life who is being influenced, uh, bought and paid for, uh, being controlled by others outside of their circle, and that pisses them off. And you know that had a political feel. So the controlling people were political, um, and it all felt quite dark now. This reminds me of what could be considered a quote unquote enlightened person. Okay, these are um, people who are part of the ufology community. I don't mean to denigrate their beliefs or their um their activity but i think it's emblematic of any type of um psychology whether it's anti-beatles uh, skeptics or people who are promoting various uh, forms of quote-unquote disclosure out there not that i'm going to stop looking at it and, and examining it myself um but at, at this point i you know i'm, I'm not convinced uh, of of these findings here that supposed uh, empaths are are coming up with. You may have, have different uh, conclusions. I'm, I welcome the comments below. I will be posting on my Patreon site some additional information, uh, mostly articles that, uh, that are beginning to appear about this resurgence of interest in um, ufology or um, off-planet intelligence dealing with AI and, and and related topics. I think it, you know, for all its weaknesses, I think it's much better because I think it, we're pretty much tired of it. It's worn out. I think it's much better than um, BLM and La Raza and uh, GLBTQ. So I'm figuring that these foundations and uh, various intelligence entities will, will begin subsidizing curricula at the university so that they can control it. Right. Anyway. That's my uh, assessment for now. I appreciate your time and your patience. Uh, share this, please, with uh, this video with others. Like it, subscribe, and join my Patreon. It's a very lively group of people of uh, independent minds. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week, God willing. Bye.